بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه أجمعين رب يسر وأعين يا كريم وافتح بالحق إنك الفتاح العليم Welcome uh, everybody near and far to this uh, webcast of the first in a projected insha'Allah series of four lectures on the uh, Imams of Fiqh, the founders of the four canonical Sunni madhabs or schools. We'll begin with uh, the madhab of uh, Imam Malik bin Anas al Asbahi, radiallahu an wa arda. But before we start talking specifically about the Imam and his life and his fiqh and his compilations and his impact, uh, it might help if, since we're at the beginning of this uh, road, and given the enormous importance to the, the deen of the Muslim of correct following, ittiba' of the Holy Prophet wasallam, if we begin with a few reflections about uh, what it is to be connected to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given us a very basic creed in the form of the Shahada. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa The first indicates tanzih, transcendence. It doesn't even predicate anything of the divine nature. No God but God characterizing the ineffable, ultimate, as that which is beyond predication. But then there's also, as well as the vertical, there's the horizontal. How are we to deal with that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so completely beyond us? La tudrikuhu al-absar, perceptions of any kind cannot attain him. Uh, what can be the basis of our religion? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the horizontal as well as the vertical by adding the second shahada, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. It is through him, through his scripture, through his guidance, through his example, through his inner wisdom, through the transmission in all of its thousands of chains that he inaugurates that we come to know the ineffable. He is the beginning point of our knowledge of doctrine. He is the beginning point of our knowledge of law, our knowledge of spirituality. He is the Sarcheshme, the fountainhead. Now, Islam is a practical way. And there's uh, the divine justice manifest in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made our salvation dependent on complex logic chopping. If that were the case, then he'd have to be a member of Mensa in order to uh, enter paradise, and that is not the divine intention. Instead, he has said that at the last day, لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم. Neither wealth nor offspring will be of any avail. Only him who comes to Allah with a sound heart. It is the heart that is the basis of our human engagement with the Absolute. And the capacity of the heart to approach the Absolute is not determined by any genetic predispositions. In other words, it, anybody can be saved. Smart or stupid, male, female, whatever language you might speak, uh, the universality of Islam reflects the universality of the divine intention that everyone has the chance of salvation and conforming to the original model of man. But how are we to do this? Well, the meaning of Muhammad Rasulullah is precisely that we have to configure ourselves in a certain way if that heart is to be worthy of the divine acceptance. If we try and work things out for ourselves, we're like uh, people bumping around in a cellar in the dark. We don't know where we're going. We might uh, be able to create some kind of lifestyle for ourselves, but it will be full of suffering full of misunderstanding, and it won't be very good for social cohesion, as they say nowadays. But instead, we need some kind of light. We need to be able to open our eyes and to see, and we can't do that unless there is light. We have the capacity to see, 
but unless the light is present, we won't be able to operationalize it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uh, in the world multiple signposts pointing back to him. But the way in which we act on the intuition that those signposts give to us uh, is something that we cannot work out on our own. Instead, what we need is to be initiated into a form of life that shows us what it is to live without ego. Not easy. How many people attain that? But if the outward form represents a model of perfection, then it is easier for us to conform ourselves inwardly. Just as if we wear particularly casual clothes, it's harder for us to behave in a very dignified way when we're in the company of others, or even on our own. Uh, and if we wear very dignified clothes, it is easier to behave in a dignified, restrained, honourable way, to pray, to do beautiful things. Similarly, with every other aspect of life, if we take upon ourselves the robe of honour that is the prophetic sunnah, that will enable us to behave in an honourable way, and inshallah to be honoured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Dar al-Karama. So the outward influences the inward, just as the inward influences the outward, and therefore we have the fiqh, the sunnah, the sharia of Islam. It's not possible for the outward to be one thing and for the inward consistently to be something completely different. Although very often, that dichotomy, that split, is what characterizes us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined that there will be a way, a minhaj, and a law, the sharia. And rather than presenting us with abstractions, he in his mercy has given us what we human beings need and crave, and rightly so, which is an actual role model, a real human being, uswatun hasana. Uh, and thus we have the great dominant driving determinative feature of Islam, which is following the sunnah of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, there has to be an inward as well as an outward following. It's no good praying all the prayers that you can find in the books of fiqh, but if your heart, if your heart is still full of uh, deceit and lying and distraction and envy, there has to be an inward conformity. There must be the inward sunnah as well as the outward sunnah, and that has its own discipline in Islam, which we may speak of later, inshallah, in a subsequent lecture. But today we're talking about the outward, but we'll see throughout the life of this great imam how closely connected the outward is with the inward. And it's important for us to realize this because very often, we Muslims today, because we are in an environment where so little around us seems to invite us to what is true and good and honorable and noble, everything is about distraction, entertainment, money, ego, very difficult for us to reach for the sunnah in a way that is not egotistic. And the most dangerous person on earth is the one who uses the sunnah, brandishing it as a weapon with which to hit the heads of those whom he despises or is insecure about uh, or is envious of. Uh, this is a plague. Very often the word sunnah and the word bidah, which is its opposite, are used as weapons to justify the self in its state of turbulence. And this is, of course, a demonic inversion, and its consequences will be disaster and darkness for the Ummah and for the world. But the principle remains. When the inward illuminates the outward, and the outward is shaped by emulating the one who was Khairul Bariya, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a miraculous new type of human being exists. So we need to follow. But when we look at the books of the Sunnah, we find they're enormous, uh, voluminous, oceanic, more than a million different hadiths. The pre-modern world's largest body of literature is the hadith of the Holy Prophet Ancient India doesn't have something so big. Ancient China doesn't have anything so big. The Greeks and the Romans, the hadith is enormous. Why? Because, of course, of the love of the Salaf for the Holy Prophet وسلم, and their determination that no little detail, however little, might um, not be uh, might might. Uh, be preserved for, for posterity out of the love that they had for the Holy One Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their belief that even the smallest sunnahs are things which can ennoble us. So we have this, but they're not all in one book. They're in hundreds and hundreds of different hadith collections, only a few of which have been translated into English. 
And there are many hadiths which are not in collections which have been translated into English, but which are sahih hadith, which are sound hadiths in which the ulama have used. So what we need to do is, rather than bewilder ourselves and misguide ourselves by cherry-picking hadiths that we happen to have come across, not knowing their context, not knowing Arabic perhaps, uh, not knowing that there are other hadith that might qualify or even contradict that hadith, what we need is to follow the guidance of the scholars of the Ummah in determining what those hadiths mean, and particularly in determining what those hadiths mean in their original context. That is to say, the context of the early Muslims as a living community. Now, you might say, why should there be four? We're having four lectures on four imams and four madhabs of Sunni fiqh. Really, to, to be a Sunni Muslim means to follow one of the madhabs of Sunni fiqh. That's the only definition that, that's really available. But why should we follow these scholars? Well, the answer is that this is really a matter of historical evolution. It could have been the case that there were 20 madhabs of Sunni fiqh, or there were two madhabs, uh, but it has just worked out that this was the case. And it has to do with the way in which the Sahaba were distributed in regional schools, some in Mecca, some in Yemen, some in Iraq, some in Egypt, and local schools uh, developed on the basis of the particular style of fatwa of those companions in those places. But part of the beauty of, of, of Sunni Islam is that it has not just schools of law, which sounds terribly dry, but you could say different uh, conminglings of the perfume of the hadith of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Each of these madhabs and the lives of each of the imams is a, a beautiful reminder of the, the, the beauty of the founder ﷺ. But in earlier ages, um, there were more madhabs. There are madhabs, Sunni madhabs in early Islam that uh, no longer exist. The madhab of Imam Awza'i, for instance, who's buried in Beirut, was a very significant one. The madhab of Layth ibn Sa'd, the madhab of Ibn Jarir at Tabari, um, there were plenty. So, for instance, just to give you an example, in the third century, Ibn Qutayba, um, a great uh, writer on literature and, and, and hadith, uh, writes this, just to list the ulama that he was aware of. Those leading scholars and recent jurists, active minds which are unequaled, the likes of Sufyan al Thawri, Malik ibn Anas, Al Awza'i, Shu'ba, Al Layth ibn Sa'ad, Ibrahim ibn Adham, Muslim al Khawas, Al Fudayl ibn Ayyad, Dawood al Ta'i, Muhammad ibn Nadr al Harithi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Bishr al Hafi, and others like them who are closer to our times. All of these for them are mujtahid imams. They have schools uh, which people are following. But as time goes by, some of the schools amalgamate, some of them die out, some of them produce great works of literature, some of them don't, some of them turn into uh, brilliant practical schools of law, while others have certain problems, contradictions within them. So we end up with the four uh, madhabs of, of Sunni Islam. Now, uh, we mentioned that the reason for this is that the companions themselves did not all give fatwas. In fact, there may have been only about 10 amongst the Sahaba who really gave fatwas, which others would, would, would follow. And those companions were, as we said, distributed over the new Islamic world as the conquests went on. Uh, so one of the texts which we'll be looking at later on, inshallah, this amazing correspondence uh, between Imam Malik in Medina and another great jurist, uh, an Imam al Layth bin Sa'ad, who is in Egypt, which is one of our sources for understanding how Imam Malik himself saw his madhab uh, and the courteous um, disagreements which he had with Imam al -Layth. Imam al in a letter to Imam Malik, uh, explains this. He doesn't want the idea that only the madhab of the people of Medina is the authoritative, the final, the definitive way of being Sunni Muslim. So he says, Sahaba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions of Allah's messenger, disagreed on legal judgments in many issues after him. Then the Tabi'un, the disciples of the companions, disagreed very strongly on many issues as well. Then those who came after them continued to disagree, and I saw some of them myself in Medina, uh, Al-Zuhri and Rabi'a. So the scholars have always been aware that there will always be necessarily differences of opinion and disputations and different schools of thought. The idea of a totalitarian Sunni Islam, where there's only one right ruling on everything, is a nightmare that occasionally regimes have attempted to impose, 
And we'll see how Imam Malik, radiallahu an, in his um, very heroic way, actually uh, resists this as, at one of the great uh, dramatic moments of his career. Uh, and the Khalifa al-Mansur, generally the early Abbasid Khalifas, uh, the first three in particular, had this idea that it was kind of messy if you're a great imperial ruler looking at this world from the Atlantic to the gates of China. Messy to have different schools of law, different judges doing different things, handing out different rulings in different courts. You want something consistent, the way the Romans have been, the Persians have been, the Byzantines have been. The new Islamic empire seemed to be uh, a kind of legal pluralism which the tidy, centralizing imperial mind didn't like. So what they wanted was something a bit like statutory law, uh, of the kind that we have nowadays. A single law applicable within a given jurisdiction, which is not the Muslim way. In any case, the Khalifa al-Mansur threatens with death, of course, um, anybody who disagrees with Malik's school. He thinks, I'm going to choose the Imam Dar al-Hijra, Imam Malik, to be the final word, as it were, the head of the Supreme Court, the one who defines the legislation of Islam, and the Muatta is going to be the law book of the entire Muslim world. And anybody who disagrees is fitnawi, is causing difference of opinion. Difference of opinion is really a bad thing, ikhtilaf is bad, so he's going to behead him. But Malik refuses, and the other Khalifas then try to get Malik to do the same thing. They try to manipulate him, they threaten him. So Harun al-Rashid writes to him like this, Ya Aba Abdullah, Aba Abdullah, let's copy these books and spread them everywhere to make the Ummah follow them. Now, any other scholar or jurist in history really is going to be delighted that his books are going to be copied by imperial decree, and every, all of the books that disagree with his opinions, and they were quite passionate in their disagreements, would be, would be banned. But he will not accept this. He says, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, inna ikhtilafa ulama il Ummati Rahma. He produces the famous, um, the famous saying, the difference of opinion in the scholars of the Ummah is a source of mercy. This was Malik's opinion. It's good for the Ummah to have disparate schools and different madhahib. Every scholar, kullu alim, follows what he believes to be right, and each one is well guided and is on Allah's path. So the scholars have always resisted centralizing demands that the fiqh, the sharia, should be a single thing. Uh, and nowadays we tend to forget this. We get anxious if somebody is doing his ibadah in a way that some ulama recognize that we think is wrong. And sometimes we get into disastrous, totally unnecessary arguments in our societies, in our masajid. This is wrong. Ahlul ilmi, ahlul tawsi'ah, as the Salaf used to say, the people of knowledge are a people of expansion, of breadth. And it's actually a, a sign of westernization in the Muslim world that people think that just as the United States and England and France have a single unified legal code. The Muslim world must have the same thing. Uh, that's just not the way the Salaf thought. Uh, and we need to recognize the inevitability and the benign nature of having different schools of thought and different legal traditions. What's distinctive about Medina and the reason why he has this uh, argument with, well, uh, debate with Imam al ibn Sa'd is Imam Malik's sense that Medina is a kind of spiritual heart pumping its blood to reoxygenate uh, the rest of the Ummah. Medina is unique. Now, in order to understand Malik's intense love of the people of Medina and his, amongst the other ulama, at least the other madhahib, unique insistence that the practice of the people of Medina, by which he means the scholars of the people of Medina, is actually an authoritative asl, one of the sources of the sharia. Uh, you have to imagine what it was like to be in Medina at that time. He's born in the 90s. We don't know exactly when. There's differences of opinion. Uh, in other words, the tabi'in are still around, and people kind of remember the glory days, the ten years of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in the city of Medina, and they certainly remember the, the, the three uh, Khalifas who ruled from Medina. And it's it, the afterglow. I mean, the sun has set, but the sky is full of light. And people still remember the thing that staggered everybody in the city at the time of the Holy Prophet, وسلم, which was that the city became a city of light. 
That is to say, before uh, the Holy Prophet came to Medina, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it was in the grip of internecine warfare. It wasn't even a city, it was fortified villages. Everybody had to be in a fortress. It was like an oasis full of bunkers. And they would fight against each other, and the Bedouin would come in from the desert and attack them and burn their crops. And it was really a very precarious place to be. And not united religiously, the Jews had their own thing, but the Arabs were worshipping various ancestral pagan deities without even the consolation of a belief in life after death. No unifying law, so they're at loggerheads all the time, feuding, vendetta, um, tit-for-tat killings, going down the generations, sometimes down the centuries, and no higher sense of law or any hope at all. And uh, magic, witchcraft, ugly things, darkness. Holy, the Holy Prophet وسلم, comes and quickly sweeps all of that away, and you can imagine how delighted they were. Now they had a way of life. Uh, for everything from you keep yourself clean with wudu and those other things. You know how to sit, you know how a marriage should work. There's no disputations over whether marriage was valid or not. Contracts, um, everything. It's not turned into a monastery. There's still a marketplace and it bustles and the sharia creates a great mercantile civilization. People can be themselves, but in a space that is now safe. So nobody needs to fortify their houses any longer. Um, the Bedouin aren't raiding and carrying people off every other season. Amazing. An incredible liberation. And that's one reason why it's called al Madina and Munawwara. And everybody in Malik City are remembering that time and remembering and loving the one who brought about that extraordinary transformation that brought them out of the shadows into the light. The greatest of all our poems, according to most of the scholars, about the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the poem that is said to be the most widely memorized poem in the whole world is of course the uh, Qasidat al-Burda of uh, Imam al-Busiri. Sometimes people ask, what a shame that Busiri, who is this kind of court poet, should have begun with this really hackneyed set of images. The first few lines are just about the desert. The, wind is blowing and there's mountains and uh, it's just like the old jahili poetry and what is that? But look at what he's doing. The beginning of the Arabic Qasida, this Nasib section, it's about love, the lost beloved, uh, and it's about the majesty of the desert. And it's also about how the desert represents what is permanent and what is transient. The mountains and the desert scenery looks like eternity itself. The mountains are rawasi, they're solid things, and they seem to be there to impose solidity on everything else in creation. But everything else is moving. The clouds are moving, the caravans are moving, human life is coming and going, the rains come, the rains go. Uh, so there's this balance that the desert dweller knows between permanence and impermanence, and that's a very good background for religiosity because you have the sense of eternity and the sense of transience at the same time. Now the idea of the nasib which is at the beginning of the board and everywhere else is the love, beloved has gone uh, and there's a lamentation and then the signs of nature in the desert and just to look at the second line in the border or is it that the wind has blown from behind uh, Kazima and that the light uh, has illuminated or, or the lightning has illuminated the darkness from Mount Idom? Sounds just like an interesting uh, evocation of a beautiful desert scene. And then we think he gets into the serious business. But no, he's talking about every Muslim's deepest instinct, which is nostalgia and loss. The Holy Prophet وسلم, is no longer with us. Ahin ya Muhammad. Alas, O Muhammad, because al wafat and Nabawiyah, the death of the Chosen One وسلم, has left each and every one of us bereaved. The Muslim could be defined as the one who'd rather spend a day with the Holy Prophet وسلم, than the rest of his life working in a company in, in Cambridge. That's axiomatic. Yeah, late, if only. So we miss him, and the beginning of the Qasida is about the lost beloved. And this verse um, 
is it that the wind has blown from behind Kalzima? And Kalzima is one of the names of Medina, specifically talking about the city of Medina. Kalzima means that which suppresses or that which calms. Uh, and that's why Medina has this as one of its names, because before it was a place of uproar, the Holy Prophet comes, sallallahu alayhi wa it becomes a place of sakina and of calm. So it is the karma, it is the one that brings serenity. So the wind that comes, if we look at the commentaries, um, Omar al Khazporti's commentary, uh, Asida to Shuhada, is, is my favorite, one of the great Ottoman commentaries. You can get it with super commentaries, it's, it's a big thing. And he spends quite a lot of time talking about the nasib, uh, the beginning of, of the Qasida. Uh, and he says, why is it the wind that blows from behind Medina? He says, it's because of Wusulu Athar al Ma'shuq. The wind is what brings what's left or the reminders of the beloved. In old Arabic poetry, the idea is that the poet is so much in love with whoever it is that uh, he can breathe her fragrance, even though she's in some other province of Arabia because the east wind is coming from that direction. So the wind is that which brings something from the beloved. Uh, it might be dust, it might be um, seeds borne by, by the wind. Uh, that's what the uh, wind does. And Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam in Surah Yusuf says, Inni la ajidu riha Yusuf. Towards the end of the story, the brothers come back to him and he says, I can inhale, I can breathe the, the wind, the perfume of Yusuf. And they say, oh, you're uh, just in your old misguidance, Dalalik al Qadim. But no, the, the subtle person can pick up these subtle transmissions. So what Imam Bursili is saying is, we need this wind that comes to us from Medina that reminds us of the beloved. And then the light. Uh, or is it that the lightning has shone from behind Idom? Idom is one of the mountains of, of Medina. And of course, if you've been in the desert and you've seen those incredible storms, uh, when the lightning uh, comes, it's really like daytime, you can get dazzled by it and you see the whole landscape momentarily and then it's uh, complete darkness again. The Holy Prophet وسلم, is that lightning that brings light to uh, his people. So the people in Medina, in the aftermath of the prophetic life, are kind of still dazzled and amazed by what has happened and the city itself becomes sacred. Everything that he touches, every little place that he goes and prays to Raqqa, every palm tree that he touched, the Mount Uhud, everything has a particular magnetism about it. And Imam Malik's madhab is based on that sense of the sanctity of the city of Medina. It's not a purely legalistic concept, it's a sacred concept, the holiness of the city. And of course, the hadith itself indicate the Holy Prophet makes Medina into a haram, gives it uh, a sanctuary, makes it a holy city, and he says things about the city. The Dajjal will not enter the city of Medina. Medina shall drive out impurity the way fire and lime drive out the impurity of iron. If you're a blacksmith and you want to purify your iron, that's a way of doing it. It bubbles up and you get rid of the impure substances. Uh, and this has been part of, of taqwa of Muslims ever since. Uh, so we have this, and we also have a well-known hadith in which the Holy Prophet in the city of Medina seems to predict the appearance of a great scholar in the city of Medina. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu an. يوشك أن يضرب الناس أكباد الإبل يطلبون العلم فلا يجدون أحدا أعلم من عالم المدينة. The time has almost come when people will be um, riding their camels and turning their reins, seeking knowledge, and they will not find anybody more learned than the scholar of of Medina. And the great majority of, of the ulama say this is Imam Malik. Uh, that's the position of a Tirmidhi, the position of Qadiyad, obviously the, the Maliki scholars, Ibn Abdul Bar um, and uh, Zarqani, and generally uh, the position of Sufyan bin Uyayna. 
The Holy Prophet وسلم, is himself indicating the unique learnedness and erudition of the Alim al Badina, um, Imam Malik bin Anas. Um, so we have this extraordinary backdrop that shapes him, and he really is a man of Medina. He's so intoxicated by the air of the city and so reverent to everything that's in the city. Uh, he never rides an animal in his life in the city out of respect for the soil in which the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is uh, is buried. Uh, that he doesn't really leave Medina at all. And this is in the age when people are travelling across the world to look for hadiths. Imam Shafi travels a lot and, and, and so forth. But Imam Malik stays put. He goes for Hajj to Mecca. Otherwise, he stays put in Medina in order to have the, the, the barakah, the blessing of the Mujawara uh, proximity to the Holy Prophet. So he's born in Medina. And he grows up when the houses of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in are still there. It's still the Prophet's city. It hasn't been redeveloped. The Caliphate has moved elsewhere. First it goes to Damascus, then it goes to uh, Iraq. Medina becomes a kind of rather quiet backwater, um, mainly in contact with the nomadic hinterland, very Arab. Uh, and that, again, serves to protect it from some of the more luxurious things that are happening elsewhere in the empire. Um, and there was a tradition which he grew up with as a boy in which there was this sense of the holiness in the city uh, Ata bin Abi Rabah becomes the Qadi in, 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 in Mecca one of the great ones of the Tabi'in whenever he went into the Holy Prophet's mosque sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before praying he would go to the minbar and kind of touch it uh, and when one of the Khulafa decided in a gesture of generosity and imperial patronage to get rid of the old minbar, the wooden minbar of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and to replace it with some extravagant thing with mother of pearl and jewels uh, and, and, and ebony and silver. Um, Imam Malik disapproved of, disapproved of this and said, لا أرى أن يحرم الناس آثار رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. I don't think it's right that people should be deprived of the athar the relics of the Holy Prophet You remember him, your taqwa is increased. If you see the minbar where he himself gave his khutbas, if it's some extravagant thing from Isfahan, it's not the same. Unfortunately, nowadays, because of various political reasons, so much has been lost of the, uh, the city of the Holy Prophet But Imam Malik and the great ones of Medina were absolutely emphatic that you should not change things in, in the city. And there's even a hadith, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يُغَيِّرُ مَعَالِمَ الْأَرْضِ May Allah curse those who change the, the signs of the earth, which some of the scholars interpret to mean the, the willful destruction of things that indicate the specificity of a place to turn it into some um, profit-making, neutral international space. In any case, this again indicates his reverence for the city as the city of the Prophet. And his whole madhab has to be understood in these terms. Now, he is a disciple of a number of the great ones. You can imagine how easy it was to study in that time and place where everybody was tabi'in. <laughs> Extraordinary. But one of the people he was closest to, and somebody who you might kind of describe as his sheikh in the sense that we would understand it because he doesn't narrate hadiths from him but he spends two decades studying with him and going to him almost every day uh, is somebody called Ibn Hormuz maybe the most profound influence on him when he's young is this Ibn Hormuz and he said I used to go to Ibn Hormuz and Ibn Hormuz when I was there would close the door uh, and sh close the curtains and then we would sit together and he would talk about the early days of Islam and the first Muslims and the tears would be running down his beard. That's the, the taqwa, that's the piety of the city of Medina. Nostalgia for the lost beloved and for those early days. Imam, Imam Malik's ancestors are not originally from Medina. His grandfather, Amir, comes from uh, Yemen um, who came to uh, Medina 
uh, 60, 70 years earlier, but is brought up in a house of learning because that same grandfather, Ibn Abi Amr, was actually one of the great scholars of, of uh, the Tabi'in. He narrates from Omar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Aisha. So Imam Malik's grandfather has met all of these incredible people and he's growing up in this house where it's almost as if um, uh, the Holy Prophet is still amongst them. Uh, and Ibn Abi Amr has a number of pupils, including Anas, who is Malik's father, from whom he doesn't get an enormous amount. It seems Anas was not known particularly as uh, a scholar, but also somebody called Nafia, much more significant, who is a figure in what's known as the Golden Isnad that Malik has about 60 of in his Muatta, um, who was the Mawla of Ibn Omar, um, and was the teacher of Ibn Shihab al Zuhri Nafia hugely important figure for Quranic recitation, for hadith, uh, and one of the, the, the teachers in, in fiqh and hadith of Imam Malik radiallahu an. So he stays in Medina. It's this quiet place dominated by the nomadic surroundings. And... Uh, memorizes the Holy Qur'an as a child. Um, and one day, when he's still really little, he goes to his mother and he says that he would like to attend the circles of hadith. Little child. He's not being sent to school. He comes to his mother saying, please, can I go to these classes? So his mother washes him gives him the most beautiful robe she can find, winds on a turban onto him, and she sends him out. And he becomes, even as a little top, going to the great circles of, of, of knowledge in the, uh, in the, the rawda of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa and becomes distinctive in his family. So one day his sister gets a bit worried because she sees him walking up and down underneath a line of palm trees, and he seems to be muttering to himself. She goes back to... Anas, um, Malik's father, says, I saw him doing this. And he said, إِنَّهُ يَحْفَظْ أَحَدِيثَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ The father says, he's just memorizing the hadiths of Allah's Messenger, صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ He's quite distinctive in the way he looked. It does help, I think, to know approximately what these people looked like. He was tall. He had pale skin. He had blue eyes, quite unusual, um, they're not unique for the Arabs, and a very copious beard, quite a, a strong, uh, uh, masculine uh, person in his appearance. Uh, so he's attending the classes of Ibn Hurmuz and also Rabi'a. Uh, Rabi'a is famous as somebody who knows hadith, but also... Uh, is the source of much of the specifically Madani piety of Imam Malik uh, and the sense in which if you've lived in the city and you've been with those who were with the Sahaba and you know the ways of the city that was so utterly transformed by the Holy Prophet وسلم, then you have a wisdom that enables you to know what is right independently of any formal hadith that you might have. And this becomes a very distinctive thing in the Maliki Madhab and is regulated in various ways um, in subsequent generations. Ibn Hormuz also gives uh, Malik one of his characteristics to some rather annoying habits, which is that uh, about three quarters of the time when he's asked for a fatwa, even when he's in his 70s and a great, a great mufti, he just says, La adri, I don't know. Uh, and Ibn Hormuz in particular seems to have inculcated this. And that's part of the spiritual uh, transformation, that the most lethal thing in knowledge is to not want to be humiliated by appearing not to know. And so you kind of spin something, or you present something that is a possibility as a probability, or you present a probability as a certainty, and that's lethally dangerous. And Ibn Hormuz seems to have been the one who um, warned Malik of this. So uh, in Al-Qadi Ayyad's Tartib al-Madarik, which is one of the great sources for the life of Imam Malik, we have قال مالك سمعت ابن هرمز يقول ينبغي أن يورث العالم جلساءه قول لا أدري Malik said, I used to hear Ibn Hurmuz saying, the scholar should be somebody whose pupils are used to him saying, I don't know. The mark of a scholar is that he says, I don't know. 
Um, another thing he gets from Ibn Hormuz and Rabi'ah is horror of any kind of remuneration or official patronage. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ He cites this ayah quite a lot. The Holy Prophet is saying, in the, it's in the Quran, say, I do not ask for any reward from you. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُتَكَلِّفِينَ And I'm not one of those who, as it were, makes an appearance of himself. The true scholar is the one who is himself publicly uh, and in his true form uh, and is not playing up for the sake of any dunya uh, uh, interest. And there's a very um, well-known and somewhat alarming uh, athar in the Sunan of Imam al-Tirmidhi. An al-Hasan al-Basri radiallahu an qal Mara Imran bin Hussein bi rajulin yaqussu faqala Imran inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اقرأوا القرآن وصلوا الله به قبل أن يجيء قوم يسألون الناس به It's from Hassan al-Basri, one of the great early Zuhad and proto-Sufis, uh, the Imam of Basra. In writing from Imran bin Hussain, one of the great ones of the Tabi'in, who used to go, who once went past somebody who was, this is what's called a uh, uh, telling stories. A qas is somebody who's sitting around, maybe in the mosque, telling interesting stories about Sina you know, Ibrahim or about the Holy Prophet. Stories that don't really have a solid isnad, but are kind of entertaining. And this is something that has to be not banned completely, but very closely regulated, because the danger is that in order to attract the common people, you tell more and more extravagant things, and you end up making religion extravagant. So, Imran says, and this is very kind of Maliki in its ethos, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. I heard the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, recite the Qur'an and ask Allah by the Qur'an before a people come who ask uh, people uh, because of their knowledge of the Qur'an. Uh, and this is the inversion that, that, that had happened, that the, the Tabi'in in particular were afraid of. That in this great religious empire, the danger was that people were making money, were profiting out of religion. And Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, of course, has a very strong polemic against that kind of career academic theologian and muhaddith and jurist. And Imam Malik, absolutely nothing to do with any connection to officialdom. Uh, he's learning as well as from Ibn Hormuz and from Rabi'a, uh, from other individuals and quite a broad range of them. Uh, Ayyub al-Sikhtiyani, who again is a famous Nasik, a famous uh, ascetic, but also Hadith uh, transmitter. Uh, Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, one of the great Hadith uh, narrators. Uh, and I mentioned Nafi, who was the Mawla of Ibn Omar, and the great Hadith of Islam, really, is Imam al-Shafi, he says, is uh, the perfect Isnad is Malik, from Nafi'a, from Ibn Omar, from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just two intermediaries. It's called the golden chain and it's um, flawless. Also Ja'far al-Sadiq, radiallahu an, who's also in Medina at the time, who later generations see as being some kind of Shi'i conspiracy uh, figure, but of course was just one of the great uh, scholars of the city of Medina, but a descendant of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Fatima and revered for that reason. Imam Malik had great reverence for the Ahl al-Bayt uh, and also a teacher of uh, our Imam. <coughs> Interesting question then, if he's so local and doesn't really leave Medina and he's so concerned to make his madhab based on what his neighbours are doing, how is it that the madhab went global, as it were? So it becomes the predominant madhab in Spain, even southern France, North Africa, in Senegal, and then spreads to Iraq, and it's the predominant madhab in Abu Dhabi. It's widespread, Egypt, Sudan. If it's a particular to 7th century, 8th century Medina, how come it works so well in such different places? Well, we misunderstand if we think that is really in a kind of backwater because Medina is for most people on the pilgrimage road down to Mecca and everybody is going through the city of Medina he doesn't need to travel because everybody is traveling to Medina 
Uh, and before or after their Hajj, of course, they are greeting the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of them like to stay in Medina for a while for the barakah of Mujawara. They go into the mosque and then, unlike now when you just come, you do your ibadah and then you go again, then it was like a great university and scholars everywhere so you could really benefit in terms of your ilm. The Holy Prophet's mosque is like a great university and everybody who's anybody in the Ummah at some point is there and teaching and learning and it's an incredibly cosmopolitan place. So that's how uh, his madhab goes global and it's not just that he is teaching these people and learning from them but he's coming to know their particular schools of thought and also their customs. So he sees how the people of Iraq are and the people of Egypt, and the people of North Africa. He has a kind of microcosm of the entire uh, Ummah that's passing almost outside his, his front door. Uh, so that's one of the things that give his, gives his madhab a kind of universal quality and how it, it goes global so easily. Uh, so students are coming to him uh, because, of course, as well as learning with him, they get the barakah of Mujawara and the extra rewards that you get from saying your prayers in the uh, al-Masjid al-Nabawi. Then they go back to their lands and they tell people of Malik's fatwas. That's how he, as it were, globalizes his point of view. So his school, even in his lifetime, spreads quite widely in North Africa and in Egypt. Um, and one reason for its rapid spread seems to be something that we'll look at in a little while, which is uh, the kind of empirical quality of the Maliki Madhab, that he was constantly concerned to give people fatwas that actually worked and were practical in terms of the reality of their lives, his acknowledgement of local custom, his acknowledgement of what the public interest might be. It's not ideological, it's an intensely practical madhab, and people like that. Uh, it's useful to have a law code that actually works. Um, a generalization might be possible here. <coughs> uh, you might say that Whereas, say, the Hanafi madhab, as it evolves, is based on a brilliant, complete architecture which is rooted in a theological vision of the law. It's very systematic. The Maliki madhab, as it were, comes from the bottom up, from, from grassroots, from the actual lived reality of the streets and the markets of, of, of Medina. Uh, and as I mentioned, the orf and the ad are also particularly important, and public interest particularly important. That gives it its uh, its flexibility. It's based on an actual society. Because if the Maliki Madhab is a snapshot of Medina in the time of Imam Malik, knowing uh, that that represents uh, an authentic recollection of the original vision. So Imam Malik is there, and towards the end of his life, famously, he withdraws from the masjid because of certain things that he sees going on there that interfere with his ibadah, and generally he spends the last 20 years or so of his life in his house, where he does most of his teaching. Um, there's the famous episode of the persecution that I mentioned uh, earlier, which is one of the earliest of the Abbasid caliphs, Al-Mansur. Now, the Abbasids are kind of revolutionaries, and they've put to death the remains of the Umayyad family. They're kind of tough, uh, tough guys. Uh, and they forced everybody to make bay'ah to them. Uh, Imam Malik uh, narrates a hadith which represents his madhab, لَيْسَ عَلَى الْمُسْتَقْرَهِ uh, In other words, uh, a coerced divorce is invalid. If somebody's forced to divorce his wife or whatever, um, that's not valid in Islamic law. They're still legally uh, married. Um, now, this hadith became controversial because it indicated that if you're forced to do something, it doesn't work. It's not legally effective. It's a controversy in all <coughs> legal systems. For instance, if you're forced to sell something, um, to what extent can that be revoked? And in English law and all legal systems, it, it has to be complicated. But for the new Abbasid revolutionary rulers, this kind of principle is problematic because it suggests that the bay'ah, the Pledge of Allegiance of the population, which has been extracted from them in many cases at the point of alarms, is not valid in Sharia. 
So the Khalifa sends a message to Imam Malik in Medina forbidding him to narrate this hadith. It's political dynamite. The Imam says, well, I'm sorry, this is a hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the Khalifa sends a spy to Malik's house to see if he's still telling this hadith. And he asks him, and Imam Malik narrates the hadith. And then the governor of Medina uh, arrests Imam Malik and tortures him. He's flogged and is stretched on a rack um, to try and get him to change his fiqh. And his shoulder is dislocated and he passes out. Um, after this, uh, in one of the beautiful moments of his career, which shows how perfectly he internalized the prophetic adab, he said publicly, I forgive Al Mansur. I won't hold it against him uh, because he said, I don't want to meet a member of the Prophet, uh, I don't want to meet the Prophet in the afterlife having uh, prayed against a member of his family. So he just, because the Abbasids are from Al Abbas, they're from uh, the family of the Holy Prophet. The police aren't happy with this and they try to humiliate him. They shave his face, they mount him on a camel, they parade him around the streets of Medina, um, trying to get him to uh, publicly denounce himself and denounce his fatwa. <coughs> uh, and he just says, Man arafani, arafani. Whoever knows me, knows me, he knows who I am uh, and whoever doesn't know me, my name is Malik bin Anas and I say, and everybody's waiting the soldiers are waiting, the police are waiting in other words a coerced divorce is invalid however much they humiliate him and they beat him and they parade him and they shave his beard off, it doesn't make any difference to him, that's the hadith, he's going to continue to narrate it and this news gets back to Al Mansur who eventually uh, relents uh, and says, let him go. He's released from prison, and that's the end of that uh, episode. Later on, later Abbasids, because you can't ignore a giant like Imam Malik. These are the people whom the people love much more than they love these usurping various uh, rulers and aristocrats. They love the Imams, and each time they're persecuted for the sake of the truth and don't let go. The masses love them even more. Harun al-Rashid comes to his class, and the Khalifa comes in, you know, the richest man in the world, the one who's just received an organ as a gift from Charlemagne, he's really a big shot, comes into his class and he has a chair brought for him. Everybody else is on the floor, the Khalifa sits on the chair. Imam Malik stops and refuses to teach until the Khalifa himself, Amir al-Mu'tanin, has got off the chair and sat on the ground along with the ordinary students. And then the Khalifa says, um, I would like to read to you, because Malik's style in teaching is unlike the style of many of the scholars of his time which was sama, that is to say the transmission of hadith comes about when the, the teacher recites a hadith and it is learnt by the students uh, to the point at which the teacher gives them ijaza to know and to uh, teach that hadith Imam Malik's style was that the student would read it to the teacher, this is called ard so the Khalifa says, I'd like to do this, I'd like to read some uh, uh, hadiths to you, but I don't want these scruffy students around while I'm trying to read hadith. Um, so could you send them out? Uh, and Imam Malik says, if the common people are not allowed to attend because of the wealthy, how can the wealthy benefit? In other words, it's in the interest of the Khalifa for those ordinary people to be there. He's going to benefit from the give and take, the scholarly discussion, even though these are people whose lunch is probably olives and a scrap of dry bread. Uh, that was the standard fare of the Hadith student. Uh, whereas the Khalifa's palace had seven concentric walls, this huge, circular, amazing Arabian Nights environment. But for Imam Malik, that counts for nothing. He's treated like any other student. <coughs> Let's move on now and consider how this particular fiqh was uh, preserved. We've mentioned the, the tradition of Arud, but the uh, text, his great books are the Muwatta and Al Mudawana Al Kubra. The Muwatta, one of the great books of human history. And the word Muwatta means that which is agreed upon. 
because he said, I showed my book to 70 of the great scholars of Medina and all of them agreed with me on it. Kulluhum wata'ani alayh. So I called it al muwatta So many commentaries on it. The most famous is that of Imam al-Zarqani in four volumes, but there are many others. Uh, and many of the scholars, such as Shah Waliullah, many of the Indian scholars in particular, have a particular love for the Muwatta and have written great commentaries, have said the Muwatta is the foundation of all of the four Sunni schools. Everything in Sunni Islam is like a commentary on the Muwatta, so a foundational text. Now, what it is, is not just a hadith text. It contains hadith, but it also contains sayings of uh, the, the Sahaba and the fatwas of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, and also Malik's own fatwa or Ra'i opinion on certain issues. Um, he spends 40 years on it, we're told. He starts off with 10,000 hadith narrations, ends up with just 2,000, and by no means all of these are prophetic hadith, so it's quite short compared, say, to Bukhari or other hadith collections. Important to know that there are two versions of the Muwatta which are a bit different from two of his different two of his students who uh, record it according to a particular narration which he had authorized them to convey. The best known is that of Yahya bin Yahya al Laythi, who dies in 232. But there's also the riwaya or the narration of uh, uh, a Shaybani, Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani, who dies in 189. Um, there are issues over the authenticity of the hadiths. Uh, in fact, one of the big things in subsequent Maliki scholarship is kind of almost forensic investigation of the hadiths, particularly in the, the standard text of the Muwatta, which is the Yahya bin Yahya variant. One of the great thinkers of the Maliki Madhab is somebody called Ibn Abdul Bar, uh, who was born in Cordoba, spent much of his life as Qadi, chief judge in Lisbon, and then dies in, 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 in Shatiba. Uh, and he cr- produces this amazing book, one of the genius works of world legal history, called Kitab al-Tamheed, the preparatory book, um, which is essentially about the Muwatta and its isnads and all kinds of issues that derive from that. Uh, and in this book he concludes that if you look at the non-Sahih material in the Muwatta, there's basically just four hadiths in it, um, which uh, might be problematic. And Imam Suyuti and others generally agree that there's four hadiths in the Muwatta which don't seem to be authentic. Although the information that they convey can be supported from other sources. Some of them are what are called balagat. It's a type of hadith in which Imam Malik is saying balagani. Uh, in other words, it has reached me that the Holy Prophet وسلم, said a certain thing, but without there being uh, a specific isnad cited. So, for instance, An Malik anhu balaghu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal inni la ansa aw unasa li asun. On the authority of Malik, that it had reached him that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. <coughs> Truly, I forget, or I'm caused to forget, so that I might uh, begin a sunnah. In other words, situation where the Holy Prophet forgets, for instance, forgets something in the prayer and does the sujood as sahu. Um, he is doing that so that a sunnah might be initiated. If he never forgot anything, it would be harder for him to serve as an exemplar for human beings. And some other, uh, three other hadiths, um, which uh, also cited uh, as weak hadiths in the Muwatta. But generally, Imam al-Shafi'i says, As-sahu al-kutub ba'da kitab illa al-Muwatta. The most sound of all books after Allah's book is the Muwatta. The second of the great books, which is a bit more complicated, but very important in the development of his madhab, is called Al-Mudawwana al-Kubra. Al-Mudawwana al-Kubra, which is much bigger. The Muwatta is like that, the Mudawwana goes on. This is not written by Malik himself, but essentially is an attempt to reconstitute his fiqh and particularly his fatwas, uh, and also fatwas which were deduced from his fatwas by analogy. So you could say it's the first great text of the early uh, Maliki uh, madhab. Uh, its main channel is via somebody called Ibn al-Qasim, one of his great students who spent 20 years with Imam Malik, a great 
a muttaqi who used to read the whole Quran every day. But there's other transmitters whose material is there. Uh, Ibn al furat uh, another of the great pupils of Imam Malik, who's from Diyarbakir, which is nowadays in Turkey, who dies on jihad in Sicily, rahmatullahi ali, who's the author of Al-Asadiyya, which for the early Malikis was an important text of, of fiqh and Maliki fatwas, but not, not really used subsequently. Uh, another of his pupils, Imam Ashab, main Maliki scholar in Egypt, is also transmitting the material from the Mudawwana. But the key figure is somebody called Sahnun. To understand the spread and the nature of the Maliki madhab, you have to understand Imam Sahnun, who's buried in Qairawan. He studies in uh, Medina, and he acquires the title of Sahnun, which means like a quick bird, because he's so quick at hopping around and finding information in hadiths. <coughs> Um, characteristic Maliki feature, um, which I love. At the age of 74, he agrees to become the chief judge of Qairawan. And he tells his daughter, I'd rather be stabbed today than accept this post. He's resisted it for a year, but he tell, tells the governor, I will do it as long as you allow me to consider you and your family just as ordinary Muslims who can appear in court and be tried like anybody else. I'm not going to give you special treatment. And the governor agrees, and so he agrees. Um, so members of the emir's family are prosecuted by Sahnon when they try to send proxies just to represent them because they don't want to appear in court themselves. He doesn't accept that and insists that they should be present themselves. Uh, and refuses to accept a salary from the state is famous for giving his judgments when he's wearing big prayer beads, uh, and really the great, uh, the great figure of Qairawan and his mazar um, is a very important place in the city of Qairawan. And to give you a sense of the spirituality of these people, a description from Al Qadi Abu Bakr of Imam Sahnon. He was soft-hearted, filled with tears, humble, lacking in artificiality a man of noble qualities, good manners, and sound heart, who was harsh against the people of innovations. He did not fear the criticism of anyone for Allah's sake. Um, now, because this main early text of Maliki Fiqh, the Mudawwana, one of the classics of Islamic legal uh, theory and history, contains the narrations of Malik from these four different uh, thinkers, uh, you have quite a lot of internal diversity in the text. And one of the features of the Maliki Madhab is that from an early date is really quite diverse. There are different uh, opinions within it. <laughs> Just to give you an example, a lot of people know of the Maliki Madhab that you can pray with your hands by your side. Um, and other Malikis pray like that. That's an example of the diversity. It's called Sadl. This is called Qabd. And uh, Ibn al-Qasim in the Mudawwana prefers... Uh, this and reports of Malik that he didn't recognize or know of the position of, of, of Qabd. It wasn't the practice of the people of Medina, according to Ibn al Qasim's narration. But Ibn al Majishun and the later Andalusians in the Madhab actually prefer Qabd. And so by the time of Qadi Iyad, three centuries later, uh, the Qabd holding the hands in the prayer is reported as the. the the, the Jumhur position, the, the collective normal position in the Madhab. Although if you travel in many Maliki countries, um, particularly those whose intellectual roots are not in Muslim Spain so much, you will find that they continue to pray with their hands by their side. So a jurisprudence that's quite diverse. Now, the... Uh, Characteristic features of his madhab, I mentioned first the diversity of his madhab, the fact that it could spread to places completely unlike Medina, such as towns in the Pyrenees and work very well. The, the great greatness of medieval Muslim Andalusian Moorish civilization was enabled by the flexibility of the Maliki madhab. Uh, the commerce, their culture, everything was uh, built on Imam Malik's foundations. Um, the, uh, I mentioned earlier this very important thing to understand with Malik's madhab which is that the love for the city of Medina and the internalizing of the virtues of the city of Medina gives the scholar a certain wisdom in making his fatwa choices 
and in making use of hadiths. And you can see that particularly in the Muatta, which to people who are used to uh, other hadith uh, collections seems a bit strange because you've got Malik's opinions and Tabi'in opinions. It doesn't look like a hadith collection. It's something quite different, but it is uh, the, the spirit of the Prophet's city, which is taken by the Malikis to be an authoritative argument. So, um, one of the features of Imam Malik's use of hadith, although he's really strict about hadith, anybody over whom there is the slightest whiff of heresy or innovation um, has to be uh, abandoned. Somebody who is known ever to have told a lie, even if it's got nothing to do with hadith, you can't accept a hadith from him, even if he is known never to have told a lie about a hadith or an isnad. Uh, he doesn't accept taking hadiths even from strong scholars if they haven't memorized the hadith that they're narrating. He's really strict in his criteria for hadith narration. But still, we find this extraordinary feature which he doesn't accept blind narrating. He will uh, only accept an isnad from people who he, in his inward heart, sees to be people of spiritual wisdom and inwardness. So he said, I encountered in the city sheikhs who were people of merit and righteousness, they narrated hadiths, but I transmitted nothing from any of them because they did not know what they were narrating. In other words, just to be a kind of memory machine regurgitating mountains of hadiths uh, disqualifies you from being a teacher of hadith. There has to be the inward wisdom of understanding that the beauty of the sunnah, which had liberated Medina from, from darkness. Uh, similarly, uh, he would. Uh, this is characteristically Maliki. The existence, even of a nos, a clear uh, statement from revelation, uh, is itself not automatically a decisive proof. Uh, and there's a lot of taqsis in the Maliki madhab, taqsis al am. That is to say, there can be a statement in the Quran or the sound hadith which seems to be. Of very clear, but in fact the Malikis are particularly concerned to see the context of that hadith and to see it in the context of the wider wisdom and the collective patterns of life in the city of, of Medina uh, and this taqsis al-am specification of unqualified hadiths uh, is something that, that is very characteristic and gives the madhab a lot of its uh, flexibility. An important principle for Imam Malik is called Sadda Dara'i'a. Uh, it's, it exists in the Hanbali Madhab as well, but Malikis really make a lot of it. Uh, Dara'i'a is the plural of Dari'a, which in Arabic means a means, a means to an end. So Sadda Dara'i'a means lifting the means, literally. In other words, referring means to their consequences. What leads to something haram is itself haram. Um, and so forth. Uh, and this terminology, uh, preventing the means uh, to a wicked end, but also encouraging the means to a good end, um, which is called Fatha Dara'i'a, in the fiqh of Imam al Qarafi, and subsequently becomes a very sophisticated and distinctively Maliki feature of their jurisprudence or their usul. So this idea that uh, something that leads to something wicked is itself wicked, introduces an element of wisdom uh, and moves away from a certain literality. Another important principle for him is orf, that is to say local custom, what people are actually doing, the practical, workable nature and patterns of people's lives, that which society recognizes as good practice. It's a little bit like ada. In the fiqh there is a distinction between orf and ada. In English, usually the most translated is custom. Orf uh, means that which the people recognize as good practice. Ada means that which they recurrently practice. Uh, and in Maliki fiqh, like Hanafi fiqh, uh, Ada, what people are already practically doing, is regarded as an asl, a source of Islamic jurisprudence. As long as there's no decisive dalil. If people are doing something, but there's a clear hadith that says that they shouldn't, we prefer the hadith. But otherwise, what people are doing is itself something that, that constitutes uh, sharia. But the Malikis, if anything, Orf is even stronger than it is for the, the Hanafis. 
um, partly because of the close connection between the identification of a good orf with maslaha, with the public interest, and the Malikis are very big on maslaha, we call it maslaha mursala, uh, the public interest, that which serves the public good. God's law is not arbitrary. God's law is there to make things easier for people, to regulate their lives, to enable them to have a context for their commercial lives as well as for their life of worship. Uh, and as a result, Malikis do surprising things, <coughs> especially the early Malikis, such as discarding a qiyas if it conflicts with orf. An analogy based on a hadith does not lead to a particular fatwa if that fatwa conflicts with what the people are doing anyway. So the scope of qiyas, although it's important for Imam Malik, is quite restricted compared to the way in which qiyas becomes a, a huge um, instrument in the uh, Shafi'i Madhab and very often in the Madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. And the, the problem of emphasizing maslaha, a lot of contemporary ijtihad gets this wrong, where maslaha um, or masalih uh, kind of overrides a lot of stuff in sharia and people just use it in order to justify various transactions in Islamic banking, politics, morality of various kinds, saying God's law is to facilitate um, human interests. We can determine human interests as being basically to do what most Westerners are doing and therefore that's what the sharia should, should be. It's very subversive. Malik is not doing that. Malik is not saying... <coughs> In our contemporary 20, 21st century society, we think that is, it is un, in our interest to have a particular type of hedge fund, and therefore we'll find some way of legitimizing it. Imam Malik doesn't do that. His sense of maslaha is not subjective. His sense of maslaha is determined by his deep spiritual selfless wisdom of the ethos of the people of the city of Medina. And this becomes one of his most characteristic usul. Amal ahl al-Medina. The practice of the people of Medina, maybe the most characteristic of all of the Maliki uh, principles. Of course, all of the four Imams rec uh, recognize that one should follow the fatwas of the Sahaba. But for Imam Malik, uh, the fatwas of the Sahaba who remained in Medina uh, is preeminent. Uh, and this is so important that he has this famous position, which is that if a, a hadith, a sound hadith, which is narrated just by a single isnad, a had, even if it's in Bukhari, conflicts with what the people of Medina are doing in Malik's day, then you don't follow the hadith, you follow the practice of the people of Medina. And that's, that's his position. So often after citing hadiths, he will say something like, Al-amrul mujtama there's this hadith, there's that hadith what we agree on doing is X by which he means the practice of the people of his uh, city um, and this again represents the pragmatic non-ideological uh, vision of uh, Maliki Matha but sometimes it's compared to English law as opposed, say, to French law. French law is like based on a philosophical vision of ethics, and then every little law is deduced from that. Uh, Maliki law is a bit more like English law. There's a lot of case law, a lot of local precedent. It's like the common law. Um, it's based on uh, uh, historic norms, practices, what people are actually doing. And that gives it a tremendous sort of link to human reality. It's very unusual to find a fatwa in the Maliki Madhab that just seems to be inhuman or not to make sense. And it's also important in the practice of the judges. Uh, the judge in a Maliki court has a lot of leeway to determine things on the basis of his own intuition and his own wisdom in order to avoid miscarriages of, of justice. So he has this letter to Alayf bin Sa'ad, and we'll, we'll conclude, inshallah, with this, in which his expressing his love for the city of Medina and his belief that this is the preeminent source of legal wisdom in Islam. Balagani annaka tufti nasa bi asha'a mukhtalifa mukhalifa lima alayhi jama'atu nasi indana. So he's writing to Laith bin Sa'ad in Egypt and he said, I've heard that you give people fatwas uh, on the basis of various things which differ from what we, um, uh, our community is doing here. 
حقيقٌ بأن تخاف على نفسك. It's right that you should be afraid for yourself. وأن تتبع ما نرجو النجاة بالتباعي. You should follow that which we hope we will be saved by. فإن الله تعالى يقول في كتابه because Allah says in his book والسابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار and the first comers, the predecessors of the muhajirin and the ansar which indicates the, the primacy of the city of Medina وقال تعالى فبشر عباد الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنا give good news to my servants who hear the word and follow the best in it فإنما الناس تبع لأهل المدينة التي بها نزل القرآن. All the people are just followers of the people of Medina, uh, the city in which the Quran was revealed. So this is Malik's characteristic conception. Islam is not just an abstract legal philosophy or even a mass of hadiths which you follow at face value, even though they are kind of fragmented, not part of. Um, a complete uh, system derived by a jurist. Instead, it's the holistic image of the practice of, of the people of Medina because they have narrated generation after generation, well, many generations in his time, just three, uh, the practice of the Prophet rather than just got it through a single chain of narrators. So he so cites his teacher, uh, Rabi'at al Rai, Elfun an elf khayron min wahidin an wahid. Uh, the transmission of a fatwa from a thousand, who get it from a thousand, is better than a hadith that comes from one scholar from one scholar. So that's his emphasis on Amal Ahl Medina, the practice of the people of Medina. Very briefly, let's end with the fragrance of his beautiful akhlaq. He would never narrate a hadith if somebody asked him a hadith or give a fatwa without performing his wudu first. He'd always begin his fatwa in a state of fearfulness. His fatwas would always begin with La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. He said, I did not give my first fatwa until 70 ulama had testified to my competence to do so. Unlike nowadays, when everybody is on some internet chat room and saying, This is haram, this is halal, and they don't know, you know how to do anything. New Muslims, and immediately they're condemning people. Imam Malik says, 70 scholars had to give me permission to express views in religion before I ventured to do that, and he was afraid of doing so. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. And once he was asked 40 questions, famously, and la adri, I don't know, was his response to 36 of them. So this was his reverence for the hadith because he saw in the hadith that which Imam al Bukhari, uh, Imam al Busiri, is telling us. The wind is coming from the city of Medina, bringing this beautiful perfume. And he dedicates his life to the hadith and to the fatwa and to the fiqh because it is the form of the Holy Prophet wasallam. And in it, he detects beauty. And those who find beauty in the fiqh, and there's beauty, incomparable beauty in the fiqh as expressed in all of the four Sunni madhabs, and nothing that we've said indicates that one is intrinsically in some way superior or more worthy to be followed, but they all have a particular fragrance, a particular way of get, reaching back to the, the prophetic age, uh, that this beauty is what energized them and enabled them to stand up to tyrants and enabled them to put up with poverty and hardship uh, throughout their lives, 60 years, just memorizing, giving fatwa, giving counsel, praying, extraordinary lives total de dedication, they didn't take holidays, everything was there, but out of love, out of love for the Holy Prophet wasallam. and that love from the city, from the Prophet himself, from the one who is Habibullah uh, wasallam, gave the fiqh of Islam its beauty and is one reason why the ulama have a, find a particular sweetness when they study the fiqh. And those who don't find that sweetness, well, what they're studying is some kind of mirror of themselves rather than a window onto the, the beauty of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us by the presence and the memory of Imam Malik and uh, Imam Ibn al-Qasim, Ibn al-Majid, Shuran, Ashab, 
Sahnon, Al Qarafi, Al Baji, and all of the great ones of the Maliki Madhab, inshallah, to increase us in love for the people of Medina, for the city of Medina, for the one who is in Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to adorn us inwardly and outwardly with the beauty of his way, uh, and to show us the ugliness of our own ways, that inshallah we will be resurrected amongst the pure ones and will benefit from the shafa'ah, from the intercession of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu feekum wal afu minkum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.